Governor, thank you for joining us. The uh, Columbian Editorial Board is pleased to welcome Governor Jay Inslee. And it, it's nice to, uh, during campaign season, we've had lots of, uh, of interviews with candidates. It's nice to have a non-candidate so we can just have a discussion. It's just a and moment of relaxation for It you. is for us, is, <laughs> yes, during a very busy time. Yeah, so for thanks sure. for joining us, I yeah. guess, uh, first of all. Uh, what brings you to town? Uh, good news, um, and there is good news here. Uh, the principal reason for coming is to look at some of our homelessness efforts that are going on in the county. And it's been a very encouraging visit because what I've seen is uh, communities that are, are, are working throughout the spectrum of things we need to do to reduce homelessness. We know this is a crisis. It's a statewide crisis. It's a national crisis for that matter. And what I saw today is uh, the, a whole spectrum of efforts that are going on. And, and that's really impressive to me, and not just doing one thing, not two, but three or four or five, and that's great. So we started going to the, uh, uh, the safe, safe Stay, a tiny home village, which is most impressive, clean, um, organized, providing support services for people there. I met a I met a young fellow who had been on heroin for some period of time, has now been clean for months because he's getting medically assisted treatment and he's got a roof over his head, which he explained to me was absolutely imperative for him to be able to treat his heroin addiction. Now getting that roof over his head, having neighbors, having assistance. He said it has saved my life, you know, and, and so it's, saving lives is a good thing and ending the squalor that was previously there. So to see that transition from a unhygienic, dangerous place to a safe place where people can have the first step to long-term re-entry into healthy lives. It's just really, really encouraging. And so we, and it's good to see our investments working too, because we put $300 million of our $800 million went into rapid rehousing. So we can get people housed in weeks and months rather than decades. And so to see that in operation and to have a guy say, look, this saved my life. That's, 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 that's a good investment of state dollars. So that was really great. And particularly because the community has embraced it. You know, anytime you start a new enterprise like this, you have questions by local neighbors and the like. But what we found is well, they originally had questions, but now they've been embraced by the neighborhood like big time. It's just part of the neighborhood. People are coming to help the people in the facility. So it's really a great story. Then we went to the fourth plane um, more permanent solution at the other end of the housing spectrum and saw 100, I think it's 106 units, which is going to be a fantastic because they're not only wonderful units, one and two bedroom, but they've also planned it to be part of the community. So they're providing community assets, community meeting places, community kitchen, right next to the schools, uh, good transit operation. So to have a facility that We've leveraged federal money. We put in $4 million of state money. We've leveraged several uh, multiples out of federal money. It's just having a community-oriented development like that on the more permanent side of the spectrum was, was really great to see. So we, we've, in a short period of time, we saw some really uh, both creative and, I think, successful ways to address the homelessness. Now, obviously, those two spots aren't going to solve the whole problem, but they've shown a rational comprehensive approach to the problem that this community is, is showing and we intend to help at a state level as much as we can. Now I talked to your mayor, we got more work to do, we got to have more land to build on so we need some zoning reforms to allow us to build more higher density housing. It's one of the things I'll be pursuing with the legislature again this year. And so is that something that would have to come at the state level? It can, it could be done at the local level but it, we need to do it at the state level so we have a state all working on this together. So I'll be pursuing some ways to incentivize and to some require uh, uh, opening up some additional land, particularly around transit corridors, um, uh, to higher density development. It's our only option here. You know, we, we're not generating more acres in the state of Washington, so we just need more places to build. So I'll be working with the legislature. We're making some progress on that. I've had some good talks with the Association of Washington Cities and the like. So I think there's a good shot at moving the ball on that. It's absolutely necessary. That's the principal reason we came down. Um, uh, Real quick, from yeah. what you've seen, how does the response here com compare to some other Washington cities and counties? Well, of course, it's the best in the state. These are, you know, <laughs> there's no question about that. Now that I'm here at the Columbian, I, uh, 
it's very favorable. Again, I think it's impressive because it's comprehensive. It seems like you have a community who wants to have a solution throughout the community to not just put all of the people in one corner of the county. Obviously, it works best when you you have a fair distribution and when you have access to people. That comes at with some more controversy sometimes because there are questions when when you start these new communities but i think that approach is most successful is fairest and and most successful because what i found is right particularly in these tiny villages i was one in tacoma a few months ago and it was very controversial when they started it the neighborhoods had a lot of concerns about about this new community and so it was a con controversial thing in, in tacoma but within two or three months, the neighbors had embraced it like, you know, they'd almost adopted these people who were in the homeless shelter. They bringing them food and clothing and helping them. And that is a story told over and over again in the state of Washington. So you get early controversy and within a short period of time, you have the community embracing these facilities. And so we hope that you'll be similarly uh, successful. So that's good news. Other things of interest I'd love to talk with you about. Uh, today is the last day of our emergency order, and uh, we're, we're glad that Washington has pulled together to respond to the COVID crisis. And we've lost good people, but we have been very successful saving the lives of thousands of people. And I just want to comment on that. With all of the difficulties we've had, we've been successful the best evidence of that is that had we suffered the same mortality rate as Mississippi uh, or in quite a few of other states, we would have lost another 19,000 people. Just think of the fact that we saved arguably 19,000 people's lives because of the things we did in Washington State. And the efforts that people made in, in a very difficult position, I think we should all be grateful for, particularly the people in medical care, the nurses who, who've worked so hard throughout this the physical therapists, the maintenance people, the physicians, what they've done for us has been truly remarkable. And, and we've saved a lot of lives coming through this together. So I'm gratified that we've, we've had that relative success and now we're in a place to, uh, uh, to move forward. Uh, other items, uh, democracy. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. let's go back just for a sec. Um, uh, regarding the emergency orders, mm -hmm. What did you learn from that? What would you have done differently? Well, what I learned is is that people are able to rise to an occasion because Washingtonians did rise to the occasion of something they'd never experienced in life. They were willing to pitch in, by and large, to try to save their families and their neighbors and themselves from potential death. And that when you pitch in, good things happen. When the community rallies, good things happen. And that's why we save thousands of lives. So I guess I saw it as a, an affirmation of a community spirit and a resilience and strength of character. Um, so I came away more impressed with Washingtonians after this very, very difficult experience that we have, we have come through. I haven't really spent much time in the retrospective scope looking at all the decisions we made so you know maybe you know that's for when you write the book or something but I you know I, I haven't there isn't anything that really jumps to mind that I would have done differently I think you could look retrospectively and argue to things we did that either we should have done earlier or we should have done later I think there's always arguments about that but there's nothing really that uh, that I regret because when you save tens of thousands of lives you tend to not regret things um, I feel good about the efforts that I was able to bring uh, to the state that what have had this success. What would you say to criticism that the legislature should have been more involved? What I would say is uh, there there is a reason the legislature has given the government everything, or the governor authority. Everything I did was under legislative authority. Mm -hmm. They gave the governor the authority to do what I did. There was nothing contravening to that legislative authority. Had they seriously wanted to go in a different direction, they could have done so by passing any bill that, that, they were, that they were able to. There were no bills passed to contravene our authority, nor was there a serious effort to do that. So I think, by and large, the legislature, not necessarily both parties, but the majority of the legislature was, 
was by and large supportive of the governor's emergency orders. And the reason is, they, the reason I say that is they didn't change them, nor did they seriously evoke an effort to do so. Um, the, uh, the other party, the minority party, uh, had a lot of complaints, but not a lot of solutions, and never really, really seriously tried to assert responsibility uh, for, for responding to this emergency. So I'm glad that we're through it now. I think that democracy worked. We were always in compliance with our authority. Um, I note that we were sued dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and the courts upheld what I did every single time. We won like 42 lawsuits in a row. I mean, Bill Walton was only 22 for 24, I guess, <laughs> Memphis in the NCAA championship. We made every shot. Uh, at least legally. So I would say we were clearly within our legal authority, and I think the results were uh, profoundly life-saving. And so uh, I think that's the general the, the takeaway uh, from it. But speaking of democracy, I am very concerned right now, um, more so certainly during my lifetime. I've been in public life, you know, for maybe 30 years, and this is a moment of time where democracy is very much in peril. Um, I think that that we we all have opinions and the parties have different views on policies and there should be room for vigorous, diverse thought in our society. It's necessary to a functioning democracy. We've got all kinds of different things to argue about. But if we lose democracy, we don't have anything else to work on. We will not succeed on anything else if we lose democracy. And democracy very much is under the sort of Damocles right now. Um, the biggest manifestations of, of that, of course, the insurgency on January 6th at the state capitol, or at the U.S. capitol. The same day, uh, an armed mob attacked the governor's residence while I was there. Uh, then we saw the attempted kidnapping of a governor in Michigan. And now we've seen the violence against uh, the speaker's husband at her, at her own home. These things all have something in common, and that is that there has been a, a fertile field that has been uh, prepared for political violence for those who have denied our election results, for those who have purposely tried to reduce the support for democracy by not respecting elections. And we are in a very, very dangerous moment because of that election denialism. And uh, if we lose democracy, none of this else, how are we going to solve our common problems? And I think that all people owe all of us a clear clarion bell of ringing the liberty bell, which is our elections work. They help us resolve things. They reach majority decisions, and they have been successful in this malarkey, fantastic conspiracy that some are trying to promote or enable is extremely dangerous, and I'm very concerned about this moment uh, that we're in because of that. And I hope people are going to go vote and I hope that they will exercise their franchise for whatever they think is the right vote. But I hate to see that suppressing voting behavior as well. What so I just want to share that with you. What do you think of Joe Kent, our uh, congressional candidate from Southwest Washington? Um, well, I'm not advocating any particular vote in this discussion. But what I will say is uh, I'm extremely disturbed by what I have read in your publication and other places. And I will say generally that any person in office or anyone who seeks an office, whether it's school board or Congress or governor or anything else, who is enabling and promoting uh, deception and conspiracy theories about the integrity of our elections, uh, I can't see how they can successfully serve in a democracy in any capacity. Uh, if you attack the very foundation, the very fundamentals of democracy, I don't see how you can succeed as representing everyone in that democracy. Uh, and so the disturbing things I've read that he has apparently uh, done repeatedly is extremely disturbing. And it continues. And by the way, I should point this out. The insurgency on January 6th is continuing. This is a continuing insurgency. There is a continuing effort to cast doubt on the validity of the election. And this will lead to a dysfunctional Congress if that is allowed to continue where that effort will continue in the U.S. Congress, frankly. 
uh, depending on how many of those folks are in Congress, and that will disable the ability of Congress to deal with things we really need to get done, like building a bridge across the Columbia River. And so I, I'm extremely concerned about, about that possibility. So this is not over. We're in the, we're in the beginning stages of a continuing insurgency. And I, I think it's hard to consider. People thought January 6th was a one-day deal. No, it is a, it is a current <clears throat> virus that continues unabated. <clears throat> What, what can an average citizen do to combat that? Well, I'm not expressing a, a recommendation of how to vote or who to vote for, but voting is ultimately the best thing a, a citizen can do, as well as speaking. <laughs> By so the, the there, Colombian. <laughs> there are uh, 19 politicians running for the office of governor across the country uh, that believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, so a, as a governor, how do, you, how do you see that playing out if some of these people are, are in gubernatorial positions? Well, first off, you don't know what they really do believe. It's hard to believe that a person can look at something like 45 lawsuits that have now been resolved and have concluded that there has been no significant, inappropriate, behavior in voting, including by Trump-appointed judges. It's hard to know that you could know that, that 45 judges have ruled that these, these elections were fair, and say that you truly believe that there was skullduggery involved. I'm not sure they really do believe that, but they've discovered a, a, a mechanism to drive fear and distrust and hatred that's driven a, a sword right through the heart of democracy that they think can help their election. Same with Trump, frankly. Look, he was, he was you know, kind of pro-choice, and he discovered how to manipulate the electorate. And that's what they're doing. They're manipulating the electorate. And it is a dastardly act to manipulate the electorate with falsehood. And they know they're doing that, frankly. If you scratched them, they'd have to say that if, if they ever had a truth serum. So it's hard to think they actually believe it. But they have found out that because of social media and other mechanisms, they were able to create a, a misperception in the public, which has fanned the flames of this anti-democratic -de movement. And we should all be very, very concerned about this wherever these elections are, because the election in Arizona affects the election of the President of the United States. So you have people down there, including the candidate who's an election denier in Arizona and other places, and in Pennsylvania where the governor controls the electoral process, election machinery, which clearly has an impact on Washington because it's a selection of our president. So we all ought to be concerned about that. That's why we'll all be looking at the election returns in Pennsylvania and Arizona and other states. Uh, and they have shown they're capable of anything. I mean, there's no lie that they won't purvey. Look at what they're saying today. Look at what conservatives are saying about the violence against Paul Pelosi. Now, I could be a little emotional about this because I know Paul personally and Nancy and have tremendous respect for them. And to see the things they're saying, to try to say that there's some skullduggery about that episode is infuriating. But they're willing to do it because they got people who will listen to them. So it's something we all ought to be concerned about. How confident are you in uh, uh, Washington's election system? We have a county auditor uh, candidate who's opposing, I believe, our six-term county auditor. Uh, so and says that there's uh, the elections have long been stolen in Clark County. So how do you respond to somebody like that? What what should we do is uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, inform people like us? Uh, what do you do? Well, I guess what I would say is, if you if you are enabling through voting or any other activity this election denialism you really are accommodating a continuing insurgency. You're part of January 6th. You're part of that mob in January 6th. And if you see yourself aligned with those folks, then I think you're, you're, in, the, you're in the wrong side of history and you're certainly in the wrong side of democracy. But you're part of that if you are enabling that right now. And that's the point I kind of want to make. This is why I'm saying this is, this is a continuing insurgency. And clearly that kind of language is 
because some people will accept it as the truth because of the power of social media, because they're only listening to one channel, unfortunately. Um, and what I would say is it is delusional. It is without any, uh, any objective evidence whatsoever. And I'm proud of our election uh, activities in Washington State. It's why, it's why we have one of the highest voting percentages in the United States, because we have made it both secure and convenient. The mail-in ballot has been extremely effective. I just read uh, an article, uh, I believe it was in the Seattle Times this morning, about how the Skagit County Republicans sent a list of 3,500 fraudulent ballots, and then I think it was maybe King TV instead of Seattle Times. They went out and actually checked for some of these people, and it was totally malarkey, just a bunch of baloney. They went and interviewed this lady who said, well, they said I was a incompetent, couldn't vote, and she was sharp as a tack. Another guy's been a citizen for 20 years, they said wasn't a citizen, just a bunch of, of horse feathers. And so what I would say is, it's just a bunch of horse feathers. That's what I would say. And if you're falling for that, then you, you're getting taken for a ride. And it's most unfortunate. So take a look at what the judges, look, if you really have questions. Here's what another thing I would say. If you really have concerns about this, if that actually is a sincere interest of yours, go read the decisions of the 40 judges who have looked at this in detail, have looked at the evidence, have called witnesses, have looked at the database who are Republican judges, and read what they have said. Those are the people who are objective, who ought to have credibility with you, including judges appointed by Donald Trump. So that's what I would say. Before you make a decision to jump off the deep end of conspiracies that that uh, a late Kennedy is somehow still president of the United States or something, I read about them today, go read those judges' decisions, for goodness sakes. That's what I would say. Don't, don't listen to me. Go read the judges' decisions. Actually, you could listen to me. That would be yeah. okay. But... <laughs> <laughs> Save you a lot. Yeah. In, in addition to fighting the misinformation, uh, what can Washington do to, to improve its selection system? A good question. You know, we, we have <laughs> probably the best system in the United States, or one of the best. So there's not any sort of Herculean steps that we could take because we have taken steps in the last five years to make it more convenient and while maintaining integrity. And so I'm thinking what, what comes to mind. Um, if there's anything we can do to make access to the military ballot for overseas military personnel, Anything we can do on that to make that more convenient to military personnel, I'd certainly be interested in looking at the logistics of that, given the timing of the situation. Nothing jumps to mind, but I'd, I'd always I'd like to be alert uh, to those things. I think the thing we can do is to push back against the the virus of disinformation, which would could suppress the interest in people in voting. I think that's the best thing we can do is to give people confidence in the integrity of the vote. That's the thing that's most pernicious, most dangerous, most anti-democratic. That's what I would encourage us. We're going to be in two years with this uh, insurrection problem. What's going, to, what's going to be like in the 2024 election? Well, I, I guess the first thing I'd say is we should deal with what we got today. It's every bit as damaging. I mean, look, the election of members of Congress is every bit as dangerous as a president. Uh, and so voters, you know, in the next two weeks have some decision. But I would suggest don't wait till 2024 to be concerned about this. Um, it could be just as bad or worse in 2024 because, and the reason is, is because such a high number of Republican office holders and candidates are continuing to fan the flame of this deception. It is unabated. That's my main concern. I think a lot of people said, oh, we're over January 7th. We're over that. We got through that manic craziness. So we're over it. I'm just, as you point out, 19, you know, candidates have questioned the election. This is your number. I've never checked. You give me a number 19, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, and, and the other thing is it, it's some folks don't I heard some folks saying, well, I'm against violence, but you're not against 
what's causing the violence, which is the election denialism. And so they've kind of played footsie with those who are willing and haven't come out forthright, denounced Donald Trump's election denialism. That's where I think a lot of people have failed. And that's just as dangerous to allow this deception to continue. You know, what I've said is that those folks who said, well, I'm against the violence, that's enough, but I don't come out and come out against denialism. That's like kind of being against cancer. I'm against cancer, but I'm kind of for smoking. <laughs> and that's what I think we're seeing a lot of right now, unfortunately. You, you mentioned 2024, so real quick, one word answer. Will you be on the ballot in 2024? I don't know. Okay. That's three. That's three. <laughs> you got to give me three. Okay. <laughs> I haven't thought through that okay. far ahead. Uh, hey, Colleen? Uh, yeah, during the course of our interviews with different legislative candidates, one of the questions we asked everyone is about the state, the, the budget surplus. Mm -hmm. as it's not quite as expansive as it had been, but there still is a, what, 40 some billion dollars at this point in time. What, at this point in time, what do you want to see done with that? What, do you have any specifics on what your budget proposal is going to be? So we're building our budget now, so I, even if I could, I wouldn't share it with you today. <laughs> but I can't, because it's still in the stages of development. I guess, broadly speaking, I would say there are some buckets that we need to continue to invest in. Certainly our housing crisis, which is a statewide crisis. Certainly in our mental health uh, crisis, particularly for our young folks to improve our mental health capacity. Um, our staffing challenges in state government are still profound. We have to have a compensation structure where we can actually get people to go to work for the state. And so increasing our competitiveness to actually be able to get people to come to work in the ferry system, to come work in Western State Hospital, to go to work in our colleges, you've got to remain, you have to be competitive. People are going to work for you. So we have to be competitive uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, so we have needs for uh, future investment that are profound, and, and these things are not cheap. Right? This, you just don't snap your fingers and build more housing. By the way, one thing housing, I do want to make a point. You'll hear me strike this chord a lot. We need more mental health. We need more chemical addiction problem uh, uh, wraparound services. But we need housing. We don't have enough roofs for the people who live here. We've had a million people move in here in the last decade plus, And we've built maybe a quarter or maybe half of those number of houses. When you don't have housing, what are you going to get? You're going to get a homelessness crisis. So fundamentally, we have to find a way to build more housing. It's not just low-income housing. It's middle housing. It's people. It's housing for people in middle incomes. Because if you don't build housing for people in middle health, in the middle of your market, they squeeze out those in the lower income by raising rents. And that's what we've been experiencing. Not everyone who's homeless has a mental health or chemical addiction problem. A lot of people just can't pay their rent even though they're working. Mm -hmm. So building middle income housing is also very important. That's why freeing up more land upon which we can build middle income housing is, is very important. So would you favor changes to land use laws? Yes. We, we, have to, we have to free up more land, particularly in our urban areas, for denser housing. There's no other solution to this problem. Unfortunately, vast swaths, I think 80 or 85% of Seattle is, is zoned where you can't build housing for people. And so you have to, we have to change some of our zoning, our restrictive zoning laws, that are contributing to our homelessness crisis. There is no other way around this. And so working on a statewide basis to enable and encourage local communities to do that is something, there's no other solution to this problem. You gotta build more housing. And some, I say this because it, it's one of those obvious things that we don't say enough. <laughs> That's a real issue around this county. Uh, so the area by the Clark County Fairgrounds is, is poised to be redeveloped for more housing. And of course, it's, uh, there's controversy locally, as there always is with projects. So, anyway, so that's an interesting. Uh, 
people. That is, that is a statewide issue. Is that the case even in eastern Washington or yes. mostly in western Washington? More so in western Washington because the growth curve, but still, it, this is a statewide issue. We need housing everywhere. There's homelessness crisis in every urban area in the state of Washington. And so it is a statewide issue. It's why the state legislature needs to act act on this. And again, it's a in part an irony of success. You know, we have one of the most successful states in the country. U.S. News World Report listed us as the best place to live. We were just listed as uh, recently as the best one of the best places to work. I think we were either number one or two. We've been listed as the best place to to be a business. So we've been listed in all the best places either one, two, or three in the, for the last several years. But as a result, everyone wants to move here. So everybody's moving here, particularly high-tech workers who are high income. And they come, we don't build enough housing, and they boost the, the housing costs, and people then end up homeless. So it's, it's an irony of success that we've had such a success in our state of Washington in so many different ways that ends up as one of the factors of our homeless crisis. That's why you're going to build more housing. So the desirability of, of Washington as a place to live and work is, is part of the reason. It's part that of the we reason worked up uh, into this crisis. Thing. And there's two solutions to that: one, become less desirable, <laughs> or that two, build better. more housing. I favor the second approach. <laughs> now I would note who's been governor for the last few years. Why Washington has become the number one place to live in the United States. If I was in the ballot in the future, I might bring that up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's just interesting. Do something, do something about the weather. We're not even in the top 20. Yeah. The weather, no, the weather is great. We finally got some rain because yeah, the forest tired, fires yeah, have been so devastating. Smoke. Obviously, we haven't talked about climate change t today, but, but you know, bring that smoke or kids couldn't even go outside. We, we got we to gotta get on top of climate change. We just came from... Tidewater, they're putting an electric crane, so they're switching from diesel to electric to reduce pollution. Thank you very much. They're looking at other ways to electrify their operations. We're making progress on this. You know, the clean energy economy is growing like crazy in Washington State. Two, two of the newest, biggest battery companies in the world are going in, in Moses Lake. Uh, we just flew the first electric commercial airline. Um, that was built, also Moses Lake, wasn't it? Uh, it'll be tested in Moses Lake, yeah. manufactured in Moses Lake. The development was in Arlington. Had the biggest fuel cell engine in the world made in Soto. We're making solar panels like crazy in Bellingham. Uh, clean energy is, you know, we're importing wind turbines through the port of Vancouver. It's just the, the clean energy economy is just taken off here. So we're making progress. We now have the Cap and Invest Bill. It's the best in the United States. It's created billions of dollars of investment, part of which can help homelessness by helping people stay in their homes and rehabbing their homes so they're more energy efficient, reduce those energy costs, electrical bills. Good things are happening on this score, but we're in a race. We're in a race, and climate change is, is, a, is a real monster. So can you talk a little more on Friday you made an announcement about uh, taking steps to uh, further uh, safeguard reproductive rights in the state yes. of Washington. But can you just kind of recap for us what you wanted to do? Well, uh, my comment is uh, the right of choice for, for women in the state of Washington is very much at risk. It is at risk because there is a continuing effort to take those rights away. There have been 40 bills introduced in the legislature in the last several years to eliminate or restrict a woman's right of choice. We know there's efforts in the federal Congress uh, to use federal law to take away a woman's right of choice. Uh, we need to do several things to protect that. One, we need a constitutional amendment to embed this in the state constitution. We can't just, because once there's a change in the legislature, those are at risk. And we know there's one party dedicated to that. This is not an election comment. It's just a fact. I'm not advocating any party to be elected, but it's just a fact that one party is dedicated to, to do that. So there is a risk that we have to be aware of. We also need to uh, prevent the tentacles of other states coming into Washington to prevent services from being provided in Washington state. So we have a shield law that we will introduce to shield women who receive services in Washington State or associated with those services from being criminally or civilly uh, punished in another state. So 
we have a bill called the Shield Law, Shield Law, which won't allow the judicial system to the extent possible from being used by other states. We also have a bill that will prevent women's uh, private data from being violated. Uh, right now, HIPAA laws protect health data, but it doesn't protect some of your other data that you can get through various mechanisms. So we want to protect that, the privacy data in that regard. And we do have a need to continue uh, improving the pipeline of medical providers, in healthcare, nurses, doctors, etc. That's an ongoing effort for a lot of different reasons. So we need some work to do uh, to protect this this enshrined, enshrined right to make sure it's enshrined in our Constitution. So uh, where do we stand on the I-5 bridge? Well, um, I was disappointed in the mayor today. We went 32 minutes be in a meeting before she brought it up. So I just, <laughs> I, people, were, right? people were slowing down here. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, denounce her in an editorial. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will rise to her defense. She's been a great advocate and, and very thoughtful about this to try to fashion a solution. So we'll look forward to success on this. Uh, I think there's been some progress made of, having uh, more kind of calmer discussions about future design. So that's a good sign. Uh, but, you know, it depends who's elected from this area. And I've heard some disturbing comments of people now running for office that could put a monkey wrench in our ability to build a bridge. So they're quite disturbing. Uh, and what kind of partner we get in the governor's office remains to be seen in Oregon. I hope we have someone that will will be a better rather than less effective partner. So it depends who's elected on the prospects of this. Um, again, I'm not here to advocate an election of anyone, but it depends who's elected. It has a big impact on our ability to move forward. I do think we have done tremendous things in Washington with our Move Forward Washington which has created billions of dollars of revenue through our capital invest system that can help us move forward, which is huge. And in the federal level, the infrastructure bill that's passed is huge. So the state government and the federal government have recently done some tremendous things to come up with some revenues that could be available. But we have to have officials in government and local congressional office who will help us move forward. And, and there's concerns about that. in this, you know, continued just ideological mania to say we should never let anybody in Oregon cross the river is just is just the height of, you know, paranoid ideology trumping the way to just get to work in the morning. So that's pretty disappointing. We also hear a lot of just tell Oregon they have to build an eight lane freeway through their park. There you go. So it seems uh, it seems like to us no, but but I heard I've heard one of your candidates. You'll have to identify which one. Who said this just be a conduit for crime? No, this is a conduit to be able to get to work. Okay, why should you be afraid of that? And to have that attitude today, when we are so disadvantaged with this bridge and so in need of bridge, is very dangerous. I will say that. So, any other questions? What else is on your mind? Uh, trick or treat. We're doing uh, our first trick or treat at the residence tonight in two years, so we're looking forward to that. Well, yeah, Tree's going to be Morticia. I get to be Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for giving people professional journalism. We need you more than ever. You've heard me say this before, and you know part of this threat of democracy is the ability of social media for deception to be injurious to democracy and having professional journalists with some degree of objective reality is so important right now. So thanks for being here for us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Some days better than others for us. <laughs> we, need you. we need you people who have some professional obligation to check the veracity of information. And and the 
the inability to get that is so dangerous in our democracy. And we're seeing the fruits of that on January 6th. I saw it on my front lawn. And armed guys came on and knocked the fence down because they'd been swallowing this baloney on social media. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to vote.